All right. Um, welcome to the 1230 session. Uh, this one will be focusing on the role, uh, implementation, and funding of STEM education in the U.S. and STEM education in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we have quite uh, an esteemed uh, group here for you. Many of these are local um, people, and some of the, uh, one of them we at least know we brought in from D.C. Uh, so to start with, to my left, um, is Corbin Evans. He's the executive director of the Associate Students of the University of Missouri. Um, it's a lobbying group, um, but he'll, he'll definitely explain more of that. Um, to his left is Dr. Anna Waldron. Uh, she's the director of the MU Office of Science uh, Research in the College of Education, and she's an expert on STEM education and deeply involved in working um, in the Columbia Public Schools. And uh, to her left is Alan Ladwig, um, the deputy associate administrator for communications and public outreach at NASA headquarters. Um, and then to her left, I have this right, it's Dr. No, it's not correct. Right? It's, okay, that's right. Um, Dr. Troy Sadler, who's the director of the MU Science Education Center at the College of Education, and he's an expert on the importance of teaching, not just science, but the social implications of science, which especially today is talking about how we can interact politics and science. Um, and on the far left is Mr. Craig Adams, who is the coordinator for the, of the Practical Arts Department at the school's, uh, school district's Columbia Area's Career Center which is a teacher of uh, teaching engineering at Jefferson High School, junior high school. Um, so with that, they've all been introduced. They'll uh, sort of take this away. This is really focused on you guys getting involved. So questions you have, please, uh, um, we'd like to have this sort of be a person-to-person -person discussion. Um, and with that, I will pass it on. OK, thanks. Um, so the, the panel, we, we plan on talking, each of us talking for five, 10 minutes, and we'll kind of go through, but I'm sure all of us are, are happy to take questions as we go. Um, I'm going to start off with kind of the big picture of STEM and what STEM is, and then, then we'll kind of move down the line and, and hear uh, about issues around uh, fun, federal funding for STEM, um, some issues related to uh, local implementation of STEM, and then some STEM policy uh, issues toward the end. So I want to start with uh, what, what STEM is. The acronym is, is, is easy to understand, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But unpacking that acronym and really understanding what does that mean and what do the, the current calls that we hear around promoting STEM education, that's a little more, uh, a little more challenging to, to unpack. Um, you know, for some, Calls for STEM education is, is really uh, about promoting what we've done in the past around math education and, and science education, and then a little integration of, of engineering and technology. Uh, other folks, when we talk about STEM, are talking about a new orientation to thinking about mathematics, science, engineering, and technology in a truly integrated fashion. Um, in ways that our current school systems and university systems probably aren't really well set up to do. Um, so, so really getting at what we mean when we hear either at the national level calls for promoting STEM education to um, more local initiatives around a, a, a STEM program, it really depends on, on who you're talking to and, and what, what kind of framework, what issues they're, they're kind of bringing to bear. So, we hear a lot about STEM, but, but STEM doesn't always mean the same thing to, to everyone. Um, I think regardless of that initial definition, one of the underlying assumptions is that um, STEM learning and promoting STEM learning, improvements in, in STEM understanding is, is a good thing. And um, there's, there's an underlying economic argument that there are an awful lot of um, careers, occupations, um, economic growth potential in the area of, of STEM-related uh, positions. So uh, some recent labor projections through 2018 suggest that approximately 16 out of 20 of the, of the um, career areas with the greatest potential are STEM-related. Now, now these tend not to be, or the majority of these are not, are not necessarily um, kind of high level uh, graduate degree required positions. They, they're more STEM related positions. They're techn technician positions, they're engineering pos positions, they're technology positions. And so when we talk about STEM education from an economic perspective, we're not ta necessarily talking about um, university based scientists. We're, we're talking about a range of careers from uh, technicians to system analysts to, to engineers. 
um, to, to industrial chemists, for, for example. Um, when we think about kind of translating this, this initiative or this uh, enthusiasm around STEM education, from a, from a research perspective, uh, we can look at what's gone on in, in um, educational research around, well, how do, we, how do we do STEM education? How do we improve STEM education? And, and some of the, the emerging trends, and I say emerging trends because this is not an area that has a huge amount of research behind it, but there are some, uh, some solid research studies that suggest we do a few things, that we keep a few things in mind. Number one, we need to, to build on um, students, or young students, ideas and interests in science. That, that if we tap into uh, young people's elementary age and, and even, even younger, uh, that, that that would be, that has the most likelihood, or one of the most areas of most likelihood to encourage folks to uh, persist in the STEM, STEM pipeline as it's referred to. Um, building from that, it's very important in science, math, technology, education, engineering education, to recognize that, that learners of, of all ages and all cultures bring with them a whole variety of experiences that shape in very important ways <coughs> The, the understandings that they build in the, in the uh, learning experiences that we provide. So, so giving value to those experiences is, is especially significant. Um, engaging students, learners of all ages, in the practices of science. So engaging students in science, not just telling students about science, is particularly important. Um, and then, then a couple of, of, of challenges that we face. Um, recent efforts to, to um, assess students in very, in very narrow ways has tended to restrict the kinds of things that teachers are able to do. And, and it shows, uh, it, ha it has shown real, real challenges as we think about expanding STEM, expanding student interests. So we need to be careful around, around those kind of institutional um, issues, policy level issues around things like assessment. So from there, I will pass it on. Thanks. <clears throat> I was glad to get the chance to be on this panel because my first job at NASA was in the Office of Education uh, where I had a chance to manage the shuttle student involvement project that put high school student experiments on the space shuttle flight. So students competed nationally, submitted a proposal, and then actually got to turn those proposals into flight qualified experiments, which was a big thrill for them and their teachers. And then I managed the uh, teacher in space program. Uh, as my second program. So I, I've got a lot of uh, love for education at NASA. We, we are not an education organization per se, but we like to use the content of what we do to help inspire students to get them to uh, be attracted to STEM careers. Uh, Mike, if I could just show the uh, slide. Sorry. Oh, there it is. This is just to show you what the federal government is uh, putting into STEM education in the FY13 budget request. It's almost $3 billion, and there's 13 different agencies with over 209 investments in the STEM field. So the biggest uh, uh, part of that goes from the National Science Foundation, and that's uh, in the way of grants and that type of thing. And then the Department of Education is the second, and then Health and Human Services is about the third largest. Uh, NASA is fairly uh, minimal, about 4% of that total, uh, with about $117 million. And then uh, NASA, as a percentage of NASA's overall budget of $17.7 billion, uh, we have about 0.7%, uh, uh, just almost 1% of our budget, and that works out for FY13 to be about $100 million. So what we try to do is uh, focus on a couple things. One is on uh, working with uh, educators. We try to have a lot of workshops and things to train educators to help them learn how to teach science, uh, math, engineering, at both the grade school and uh, secondary school levels. We work with grants for university students, so I hope some of you students here are, are beneficiaries of that. Uh, we support an entire network around the country called the uh, uh, spa uh, Space Grant uh, Consortium. And there's one in every state, plus Puerto Rico, I think, in the District of Columbia. And those are uh, 
a consortium of universities within a state, but also private organizations, museums, nonprofit organizations that are all uh, funded to try to help do uh, STEM education with different of their uh, demographics that they work with, be it uh, grade school or high school and uh, a lot of grants for college <laughs> students as well. And then the, the newest thing we're trying to do is um, a lot more partnerships. And we want partnerships with outside organizations, again, because our funding actually went down from 140 million last year to 100 million in the request this year. Um, and we need to have our content spread to those that uh, can help us get the word out. So we're, we're collaborating with uh, gamers, uh, you know, video games and things. It's, it's mind boggling to me. Uh, I, 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 I kind of miss the uh, video game uh, bus when it came through town. So I'm a, a, always fighting to catch up. And my nephew was playing a game a couple of weeks ago and he, and he was fighting somebody. I said, well, who are you playing against? He said, I don't know, somebody out there in the, you know, in the universe is also playing this game. And it's something like, I don't know, 600 million people were playing this game. I mean, it was absolutely mind-boggling. So if we could find a way to tap into that with some education content, and then we're really starting to talk about getting to the wider audience. It's, it's going wholesale instead of retail in our approach. And I think that's what we need to do. We've got to get the message out to a broader community than we've been doing in the past. Uh, we, we had Will I Am come to our Mars launch uh, here in uh, December, I think it was. And he came down to the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Uh, he f did a documentary about his participation in the first robotics program. He's a huge supporter of that. And this guy is the real deal. This isn't something to get some publicity or flash in the pan. He is dedicated to STEM education and has created a whole uh, organization to promote STEM. But he came there, he talked with our, our Twitter, we had a tweet up there, he came and talked to the educators, he did this uh, documentary, he works with Dean Kamen and First Robotics, his band, the Black Eyed Peas, have played at the last two, I think, national competitions. So we're reaching out for those kinds of uh, non-traditional ways to get the word out to students. And I think the more of that type of thing we do, I think the better we can spread our message, and especially when Congress starts to criticize, they go, well, what's NASA doing involved in education anyway? And so what we're trying to do is show, look, we're, we're not trying to uh, go out and, and uh, change the, the way teaching is done, but we want to use our content to help inspire students to become science, math, and engineer majors. Oh, sorry. My turn? Um, when I was asked to, to come speak to this on this panel, um, I was wondering kind of what I was going to talk about because I'm a teacher at Jeff Junior High School, have been for 24 years, uh, and I'm also a practical arts administrator for Columbia Public Schools. So I think I'm going to talk about what I know, and what I know is I, I've taught a class called uh, Physics and Engineering for 20 years, going on 20 years. Um, and it's a team taught class with a physics teacher and myself. And so we block our schedule together and we teach. We've kind of gone our own way. And when I listen to, to some of the things you, that the, the last two gentlemen have, have talked about, there's, there's a couple of things that jump out at me. Is, as a teacher, one thing that I want to know is I want to know, um, I was, I've, Several years ago, I started looking at what are, what do my kids want to do? What do they want? You know, I'm, I and I, I we have a lot of information at our fingertips in the public schools, the Explore test, the Plan test, and the ACT test. We have those results, and all those results tell us exactly what the kids are thinking. What do they want to do? And that was and it struck me as kind of odd when I got this job as an administrator. I thought, why don't we why don't we use that? Why don't we we purposefully seek out and find out which every, what every, every one of those kids want to do. So when I got the job as an administrator, we actually did that. We took that data and we pulled it, we crunched it in the numbers and we got some interesting feedback. And, and some of the feedback was that the, number thir the third most requested career choice for our kids was engineering. Um, the first is the medical field. So, you know, we've got those two, we've got that information right there. We know that those kids are out there. 
So then the regional economic development in Columbia, they, they actually did the same data. They crunched the same numbers, and the same numbers came up. First, medical. Third, engineering. Second is business. And the same, that's the same for what we had in our Columbia Public Schools data. So we have that data. We know what the kids are wanting. So I looked at it. I took that, and I looked at it just down at the cellular level. I took it down, and I looked at it in my class, and I said, I want to know what each one of my kids want to know. And I found out that in my engineering class, duh, all these kids, most of my kids want to do something in that engineering field. So that's kind of led me to, to, to where I am now with STEM. And it's the way I look at STEM, the way I look at the, the STEM movement. It's always been here. We've always been, we've always tried to do, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been trying to do this for a long time. But I don't know that we've always made the connections to what we're doing to the individuals, to the, to, down to that, to the individual student. So that's one of the things that in Columbia Public Schools we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a pathway for those kids that want to be, want to be engineers. And the thing in my class I see from my kids is that they come to me and they say, Mr. Adams, I want to be an engineer. And then my first question is to them, what's your favorite class? And they'll say, well, your class is my favorite class. Of course, they're going to say that. <laughs> but uh, the second thing I say is, well, how do you do in science and math? Oh, I hate math. I hate science. Well, you're going to be an engineer. You, you hate math. It doesn't quite fit. And so it, it becomes a kind of an awareness thing. They're like, I need... I, I didn't know that I needed to be good in math to be an engineer. So, you know, we're talking to these kids, and so it's, sometimes it's just an awareness. It's just that they need to know where they are, what they want to do, so that they can make the two fit together. And so that's what we're trying to do in Columbia Public Schools is make, that, make those kids aware of this is where you want to go, this is what you need to get there, and try to make that pathway for them. So STEM is one of those paths, and STEM is a... Is a I mean, it's a, it's a, with the third most requested area being engineering and medicine. And I, I mean, it just, it just, it seemed to make, it just makes sense for us to, to put those things together. So my, my passion for this, for STEM is really, it goes back to what it's, it's for my, it's for my students. I mean, it's for what what they want and what they need. And I know that sometimes we've missed the mark and what we're trying to do is we're trying to make that a little bit more prescriptive along the way and give those kids a better chance of getting where they want to go. Um, I spoke to a gentleman yesterday in the, at lunch about um, recently, uh, we had a, last night there was a shooting here in Columbia. Um, one of our students passed away. And I remember him coming through Jeff Jr., my school, and I remember that boy coming through our door and I can, it, it seems to me that when he was, you know, in kindergarten, first grade, he had, he had hopes and dreams of what he wanted. He had, a, he had some place that he wanted to go. He had something that he wanted to do. And to me, that's, that's the big, that's where we miss the mark is, is letting those kids, when they leave us, when they don't have a direction, when they don't have a way, have some place to have a direction to go, that's, 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 a, that's a, a, a shame. That's, that's, that's our, we've, we've failed on that, that student. So I'm, I don't mean to preach or anything like that today, but that just really hit me. Um, that's why we need to put money into these programs. That's why we need to put our emphasis into these programs, because somewhere out there, there's a kid that wants to be an engineer that doesn't know how to get there. And that's why we need to, to put these, put our emphasis into these areas. So I'll let you go on from there. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Anna Walter and I direct the Office of Science Outreach. So most of my job is working with faculty and graduate students and undergraduates to connect them with schools, with teachers, with community organizations to actually share the science research that they do with the public, with kids, with teachers. And so that's what I do, but one of the projects I just wanted to talk about has to do with what Craig's doing at the high school level, and that is that we're helping a local school that became a STEM school this year. So Benton Elementary is now the Benton STEM school, and what they're doing is they're trying to develop a whole curriculum and pathway for students that encourages the students to think about STEM careers. So from the university perspective, there are tons of opportunities for students to go out and work with those children and those teachers to help them explain and learn what is engineering, what is mathematics, what is science, why should I care about this? 
And so what we've been able to do at Benton so far is we're running an after school science program every week. And we're just we're working with kids every other week. Those kids are kindergarten through second grade in one group, so we see them every other week. The other group is grades three to five, and we see them on the alternate weeks. So those kids are seeing and working with students and faculty from campus every week. They're getting a science experience that they wouldn't have during a normal school day. And you know, some people say, well, that's just enrichment for the kids that want to stay after school. Yes, but many of these kids would be going home to situations that they'd rather not be going home to, and it's a way for them to stay in the school after hours to be part of a club, to fit in with some other kids that have similar interests, and it's just one small example of something that we can do as a university to help out as Benton tries to completely reshape itself as a STEM school. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about federal funding, and that's one area that I'm really interested in, is finding federal funding sources that can help local communities raise the bar in STEM education. We need to provide infrastructure at the schools. We need to provide computers. We, there are all these things that schools need, and the teachers have the great ideas. Uh, we're working on a proposal with Benton right now. They have great ideas. When you ask teachers to look out 10 years and imagine their students' experience, they have incredible ideas that we would never think of. So we, what we want to do is capitalize on that, help those teachers and schools find those federal funding streams and state funding streams that can help them bring up the level of STEM in their schools. Um, I could give you countless examples of other schools. We're also working with Alpha Heart on a similar science club because we found that it was really effective at Benton in getting kids excited about science. Um, and so we're trying it out at Alpha Heart here as well. But there are tons of people across the country at universities and other organizations doing this kind of work in after school settings, in during school settings, just to try to improve where we can. So if there are any questions about that today, I'm happy to answer anything related to teacher professional development, related to student programs. Um, and I also work in informal science ed with museums around the state, so I'm happy to talk about that as well. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Corbin Evans, and I'm with the Associated Students of the University of Missouri. And I know that a lot of you in the room probably aren't familiar with our organization or what we do, but we are a, uh, a University of Missouri system-wide lobby organization, which I know the negative connotation that comes along with that word, but if you listen for a few more seconds, we are students <laughs> lobbying for students and student interests. And we've listened to individuals just like everyone, my fellow panelists today, and heard the dire need for STEM education funding in these areas and the different avenues of education that all, all these other individuals have brought up today. And what we've done with that is we've taken that to the state legislator. And we've taken that to state representatives and state senators and talked to them about the, the dire need for STEM education and STEM graduates in these fields. And so what we've done is we come up with three main different ideas, and one of them, uh, one of them is a uh, is a tax incentive, which I know that that's a bit of a, uh, a either take it or leave it issue with a lot of people in the room and a lot of people in general. But it's something that's important that we see if a company in the STEM fields employs an, a certain amount of interns from a higher education university or institution in the state of Missouri, we allow them to have a sort of tax break, a tax incentive to, uh, to allow them to uh, kind of encourage them to hire or employ interns because we know that internships are so vital and so important in the STEM fields. And so it's really, uh, it's really something that we, we thought we could do to incentivize these companies to hire and ultimately, uh, ultimately employ a lot of uh, students from not only the University of Missouri, but also higher education universities um, in the state of Missouri. And that's just one of the ideas. Like I said, one of the other ones is, uh, is something that's a little bit more applicable to the local, uh, the local level. And uh, that's what, what that is doing is it's setting up a STEM fund, a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fund that would be, uh, would be funded through a couple different avenues and that would be distributed to a lot of the different ideas that, uh, that every, all the other panelists have brought up today. After school education, summer education, education for students, um, education for uh, for teachers as well, uh, as far as training and different uh, different avenues that they can do to uh, try to increase interest in education on the lower levels, uh, primary and secondary education, as well as grants and scholarships and more funding for the higher education level as well and the institution level that uh, that we really work very closely on. And that's something that we feel is important, not only to get these people started early and get these students really interested in the STEM fields, but also to provide them with avenues for when they come to the University of Missouri or, or the other institutions in the state of Missouri to provide them with the opportunity to not only be interested in these fields, but also become a graduate and then ultimately, hopefully, a uh, Missouri an employee in the state of Missouri in one of the STEM fields. And that's something that, uh, 
that we've worked very close with on, and we are we are really excited about that during this legislative session to hopefully uh, to have some traction and be able to move forward with that and develop this fund that hopefully individuals uh, like my fellow panelists will be able to apply for money to be pu to be pulled out of to use for some of the great programs that they've mentioned that they've mentioned. Also, I know that we've talked about a couple different uh, a couple different grant proposals as well and how to get money. Uh, from the state as well, and we've talked uh, with a couple different representatives and have a couple pieces of legislation filed about uh, about grant proposals. And although uh, we know that it's uh, there's a lot of grants out there to get your to get your patent and to get uh, and to get things uh, and to get your patent done and to get uh, and to get your idea out there. But the problem is the prototype is so expensive for a lot of the a lot of the patents uh, that come out there that they're not able to ever actually get a, a working prototype done for that. And so we worked very closely with uh, with one of our uh, interns from the Missouri S and T at Rolla, and uh, that was one of the problems that he brought to us and said, "Look, all all these people, all our graduate students have have these patents, but they don't have the money to get prototypes." And so what we've done is uh, is we went to representatives and talked to them about that, and they've written different grant proposals and pieces of legislation for for students to be able to uh, to apply and receive these grants and so hopefully the prototypes um, will be able to be put in produ into production and so that's even more of an incentive for students to study in those fields for students to graduate in those fields hopefully that provide them with enough opportunities for them to uh, be able to actually do something very productive in the STEM field and that's something that uh, that we just really feel was uh, was extremely vital and these are the three pieces of legislation that we've been working on right now but it's kind of an ever-growing thing I mean there's new ideas and new opportunities for uh, for STEM funding and STEM education every day and it's something that we really look to make one of our main platform issues going forward uh, we've just recently adopted it in the last few years but we really uh, we really understand the vitalness and the importance of STEM education and uh, and ultimately higher education and graduates in the STEM fields and that's something that our organization has really adopted to heart and uh, is doing all that we can in the state level and the state legislature to uh, to ensure that do you have any feel for uh, the success that your legislation might um, I, I'll, I'll tell you uh, I'll tell you up front that uh, one of our the best proposal that we have right now as far as the best hope that we have is the stem fund which we think is obviously the best idea um, because it would allow for a lot of versatile um, uh, different investments and different uh, different fundings for different different mechanisms throughout the state um, to provide for summer camps uh, some of the things that you mentioned that NASA does as well those things are sometimes very expensive and so kids aren't under kids aren't able to uh, be able to do that during the summer and there's there's tons of data out there that talk about how students that do things such as summer camps NASA camps rocket camps things like that become so much more in tune to the stem fields and then higher educate highly educated overall and then obviously their interest just blossoms from there um, uh, I was in DC this summer and uh, I met with uh, Ron Paul, and obviously he has a certain uh, point of view, but he and his wife are both very ecstatic about taking apart the Department of Education. And then you have a more recent um, news bite where San where San Forum said, why do we need kids in college? Um, and I think that especially with how important college and STEM education, how much that ties to higher education, um, how would you guys what would you guys say to that if someone said, one, we don't either don't need the Department of Education or federal funding like you're looking to get, um, or that we don't need kids in college? How would you guys sort of react? How would you sort of come back to that? Can you talk to interrupt for one second? There was one, set, one thing we needed to announce at the beginning of this panel that we forgot. At 1.30, the state of Missouri is having a statewide emergency weather drill. Right. And so sirens are going to go off in here at 1.30. We do not have to go anywhere. We have permission to stay where we are, but just so you know that when that happens, that's what it is. And I apologize for not mentioning that we, we forgot to mention that. I got to go tell the other panel now. So. It might be turned off. I don't know. I don't need it. I talk to junior high students. I yell at junior high students every day. So I just, um, I'm going to talk to about the why kids don't need to go to college. That, that, that question that you had. Um, I agree some, that not every kid needs to go to college. Not every kid, and I, I, there was a time where in, in public school, if I, had I said that, I would have been asked to come to talk to my principal and he probably would have gotten after me. But what we've, we've looked at now is 
you know, when you, look at the, when you look at data, when you just ask your kids, when you look at the data, what the kids tell you, 60% of our kids stay here in Columbia. And we know that. We know that 60% of our kids stay right here. We know how many come to, to the university. We know how many come to the university and then drop out. We know a, a lot of, we know all these things. Not every kid needs to go to college, but every kid, every one of our kids has post-secondary <coughs> aspirations. They have something that they want to go to. 100% of our kids have something that they want to do post-secondary. It might be college, it might be a two-year school, it might be going to the military, it might be going to some kind of trade school. So it's not so much about why do we need college, it's we need education, we need appropriate education for our kids. We need, to, you know, we need to be more prescriptive about what we're doing and not just everybody's going to college. Well, no, everybody's going somewhere. Everybody's going their own direction. We need to be looking at those avenues and, and, and ways for kids to, you know, STEM doesn't just mean, to me, STEM doesn't just mean engi engineering or being a scientist or being a mathematician. STEM could be, I mean, I've talked to a gentleman in Kansas City that has a really great paying job, like 18 to $20 an hour for a, for a high school senior if they, know, if they have enough math and science. He could put them to work right now. Now, that might be just perfect for some, one of my kids out there who has the right math and science. So it's, you know, saying that everybody's going to go to college or, no, why do we don't need, we need, we need education. We need those post-secondary pathways for kids to go. And STEM is one of those that just covers a large, you know, it's kind of a shotgun blast for us. It's a, it's a wide area. And what we need for the jobs that are out there right now, we need math. We need, those ki we need our kids to know more, to, to have those math skills and have those science skills and have that technology background so that they can be a viable option for somebody to hire and so they can have a decent future. So that's just something I'm very, I'm sorry, I'm just very passionate about. <laughs> I believe what the president said originally was that everybody who wanted to go to college should have the opportunity. So I think the criticism was based on inaccurate information to begin with. And education comes up every few years as something that everybody wants to cancel because the federal government has no business in education. It's supposed to be for the states and of course the minute it goes away then where's the funding going to come at the state level. Um, so, you know, it's, it was one of the three agencies he forgot about anyway. So. <laughs> How do we help kids believe they can succeed in those types of situations? My daughter refused because it's working with her hands and she didn't want to do that, that classic little boy. That's and true. my son <laughs> said, um, no way, my teacher last year said, I'm way too busy, no teacher could handle me for that length of time. <laughs> and, you know, I've also had elementary teachers tell my kids, females usually, how much they hate math. And you don't get to say you hate reading in public school without getting called into the principal's office. So, you know, we were the weird family that allowed him to freeze action figures in a bowl of water and throw it off the porch to see what happened. So they, they've been exposed to this, but then I, I find as a parent I'm having a hard time at that age helping them make that leap forward. You know, I, I think this um, points to the, this, is a, this is a bigger issue. Um, I think, uh, you know, having, having science clubs, <laughs> creating opportunities, um, having opportunities for kids to engage in the robotics competitions, those are all pieces of the puzzle. Um, but none of them is, is kind of a, a silver bullet. And this is, this is a larger system. And a big chunk, of, a big part of that system at least the, the formal education aspect relates to teacher education and, and professional development. And unfortunately, there, there are teachers that, and counselors that um, are, are sending the wrong messages to our students. And this, so this really has to be a, a broader approach um, in terms of moving the STEM agenda forward. I mean, you're... you're In 
entry level? 30. 30. 30. Because how do you recruit to that team? I mean, the gentleman from NASA, I think NASA is a way to recruit. You think back how exciting Space Age was. It was cool to be a scientist back then. Your budget just got cut, hope I wrote the numbers right, 40% in one year. And you were really nice about it and talked about how you were trying to work around it, but a 40% cut in education in NASA is unacceptable after 10 years in Afghanistan. You know, it's a choice that we make at the local, yeah. state, and federal level. So I'm thrilled that you guys are making a difference. There is one other thing the administration is trying to do, and this is a very small piece, <laughs> but that is to focus on STEM, and that is these White House science fairs they've been having the last two years in a row now. I think the most recent one was the last <laughs> month, I believe. And they bring winners of some of these various uh, science competitions, the Lego things, the uh, first robotics, other things, West, what used to be called Westinghouse, now the Intel science Intel. fair maybe. Um, and they brought them to the White House and treated them like they were professional athletes. In fact, the president said, we should focus on the science students just as much as we do on the Super Bowl winners. And, and until we start getting over this unfounded image that you know science and engineers are geeks and it's not very exciting, you can't make any money in, in these areas, uh, this is something we all have to work together on. So NASA tries to do what it can to show the excitement involved in science. We put our astronauts out there so that they can be role models. We put our scientists and engineers out there. Uh, we work with people like Will I Am. I mean, we are looking at a wide range of different ways of, of helping turn this around. And it's not going to happen overnight, uh, but I think we're on the right tr track for it. Go ahead. I just have one thing. I'm going to give the university a plug because <laughs> I've spent I've sent the university a lot of money in the past several years because all three of my kids graduated from the University of Missouri, um, and they're all going to be teachers. So, and they're all our teachers. Actually, I have a, a son that teaches in Jeff City. I have a son that's that's subbing here in Columbia. It's going to be a teacher, hopefully here in Columbia, as a special ed teacher. And then my daughter teaches over at Lee. And when you were talking about an elementary school, my daughter was well, very well equipped to to go into the classroom to be. You know, in the science, in the areas of science, in the areas of math, and I think the university has has really done a good job of educating the kids coming out today. They're much better, and they're much better equipped to go into the classroom. To you won't hear. I don't. I, I I hate math and I hate science because they have a very good. I feel like they have a very, at least from my standpoint, from talking to my daughter, they have a very good background of science, math. You know. Um, English, whatever, whatever it is, they're very well. Those educate or elementary education teachers are, they're doing a great job. So, I think that that's that's encouraging to me. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that because my question was based on hearing uh, yet another girl say, "I don't like math." Uh, in in the 1990s, the GAO wanted to do a study on whether male engineers and female engineers were being promoted at the same level and receiving the same salary. They couldn't do the study because there weren't enough female engineers to be statistically significant to do the study. And um, so what is STEM going to do to specifically? I mean, you're, we're talking about cultural, social uh, roots that are so strong. What are you going to do? How do you get girls into this stuff? It is International Women's History Month, and NASA just did a big STEM thing for women. Uh, and we had now have a special spot on our website that promotes women at NASA. And we're trying to show younger uh, girls that, you know, here's a profession you can uh, strive to. Here's what you can, you can be a scientist and engineer. Uh, and people like Sally Ride, former astronaut at NASA, created the Sally Ride Science Clubs for Girls, specifically aimed at girls in the uh, grades four to eight to get them excited about science and engineering, not just about space, but about all disciplines of science, so that young women can see themselves as a scientist or engineer some time in the future. They have special programs around the country where f female role models are brought in. It's, it's gonna take a while to, to turn this thing around, 
but because of the, uh, what I believe will be career opportunities in science and math in the five <coughs> to ten years ahead, we certainly need to have more women and more minorities involved in science and math education. Right. It's also, the National Science Foundation has, a, we are all mandated to encourage women and minorities to pursue paths, so when you get a grant, the NSF wants to know that you are actively recruiting women and minorities into STEM fields. So I don't know of a single NSF grant, and there are many on this campus, millions and millions of dollars worth. I don't know of any that aren't actively trying to recruit women and minorities. Our challenge is typically that the pool is small, like what you were saying. So until we get more students to pursue those but fields. Isn't that a chicken and an egg? I mean, yeah, the pool mm -hmm. is small, but the mm -hmm. pool is small because when girls reach 12 years old, mm -hmm. they think, boys don't like smart girls, so they start yeah. getting dumb. Yeah, there are certainly sociocultural issues that will continue to be there, and, and in, as a culture, I'd like to believe that we're moving in a more positive direction because people are making concerted efforts to make a change there. Uh, I know that the College of Engineering is hosting lots of different events for boys and girls to come and do engineering events on Saturdays mm -hmm. so that they can get to see what is it like to be an engineer. It's girls and boys, and it's usually a mix of about 50-50, so that's encouraging to me. Can I just follow up on that? So um, I, I think it, it was brought up by the panel, but yes, there are fewer women role models than there are men. But the issue of women role models is not nearly as scary as the issue of anybody who's not white. That's true. And so, and this comes to an issue that was brought up. We have all these programs that our kids can do. There are summer programs in science. There's Lego camps here. They are damn expensive. I can put my kid in them because I'm a professor, I can afford that. But the kids that can't afford to go are the minorities. And so how do we facilitate getting them into, and it's not it's not even cultural, I mean, there is a culture of girls being discouraged, but it's even worse when you come down to socioeconomic and minorities. <coughs> how do you get girls into these programs? I think the ones that uh, Anna was talking about at Alpha Heart and um, Benton are great, but it needs to be wider spread than that. So how do we provide both the cultural and the economic incentive to get these minorities into these programs? So can I, along with, we brought up economics a couple of times, so uh, I'm going to jump in on this. Um, You're an economist. That's, that's my background. So it's going to cost more to get a higher trained people into K through 12 education teaching the, if we start just with math, if math is the language of, of all of the things that we're talking about, K through 12 education at the math level, uh, it, it, it may cost more money. So, but there seems to be a culture, not just in the Columbia public schools, but across the nation in the public schools, that um, paying somebody more, an entry level teacher, maybe 20% more because they're a math teacher instead of an art teacher is taboo. And the second order thing is that the, the, the taboo of, of, um, of whether you go through an education school or whether you're actually a mathematician who just happens to be a really good teacher to K through 12. So if the panel would like to comment on those two taboos and, and that cultural aspect, I'd be really curious to hear. Think about that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't want to, not to bring up unions because I don't want to really go there, but at the same time, I know in a lot of states that are unionized, there are union-related issues where teachers come in with a certain amount of experience. Regardless of the field, they are going to be paid the same because that's just a labor issue and a union issue. So I think we don't have that challenge here in Missouri, but other states do. So I think as you look across the country, if we raised all teachers, teacher wages up, we'd probably be in a better place with people ch not choosing the job at the engineering firm over teaching at the career center. Or, you know, if you have economic choices, you're gonna make them for the best of your family unit, whatever that is. So I think that's, I think you could raise them across the board and probably make some gains. In, if, if I could address the, the second part, the second taboo around um, bringing in folks with, with content expertise um, versus versus uh, education through colleges of education. Um, I think there, there's, a, there's a fair amount of data out there that, that show that, that one's, one's mastery of, of a content area, let's say mathematics, 
is not necessarily a good predictor of success in the classroom. So um, what, what we see happening in a lot of kind of alternative routes to, um, to the classroom, if, if career changers or professionals come into a classroom without any uh, background in education, then what happens with most of them is that they leave within five years. I think that uh, I think the, the the figure, the statistic is around 75 percent are gone within five years. And obviously, it's not because they don't know the mathematics or the science or the engineering, but teaching is is complicated work, and classrooms are complicated complicated spaces. And so, there's there's a lot that goes on in getting ready to to teach effectively. Uh, and being successful in classrooms and, and, and being able to, to persevere through those first few years, which for all teachers are pretty difficult. And I think, not all, but, but I think most colleges of education um, work to, to, uh, to help people make that transition and understand the kinds of issues that they're going to be facing with, be able to, to respond to the developmental issues associated with working with children and all the other things associated with teaching from assessment and um, issues around what, what it is to learn, et, et cetera. So I, I, I don't think that there's, I, I mean, I'm personally certainly not uh, opposed to, to folks with, with expertise in, in areas to come and, and, and uh, teach our children, absolutely. Um, but but what, we, what we know is that we need people, successful teachers need expertise in, in a content. They also need expertise in, in teaching. I, I'd like to add something to that too. Um, as this is my second year being a an admit the practical arts coordinator, and one of my jobs is to go around and, and to to observe my teachers. And I don't think that I have in my 43 and a half teachers that I that I uh, supervise. I don't think I have a teacher that doesn't have content knowledge. I mean, doesn't have good content knowledge. I don't think there's anybody out there that I have that doesn't have good background and, and whatever they're teaching. I think they, they're, they do an excellent job in that. Now there are different ability levels as far as the art of teaching. And that's, that's the thing that I think we are doing, we're trying to do a better job in public education now is to, is to get at those, because you know, there are teachers out there, there are teachers that, that have the knowledge. I mean, I've, I've seen student teachers come through that, you know, we had a, one a couple years ago that was, a, that was a just a genius in physics. I mean, he was, he was incredible. Now, the art of teaching, he, he struggled. And, and, but those, we need to work with them. And, and that's the part that, that, we're, that I spend most of my time talking to my teachers about is about, you know, classroom. It's really classroom management. It's not really the content matter. It's the classroom management. So, you know, I, I, it's not about, and, I, I, and I've talked to several people in math and science, and it's not about the, that they don't know the science, they don't know the math. It's, it's sometimes it, it's, it's, Classroom can be a scary place sometimes for some people. So um, that's, the, that's the part that I think we're spending a lot of our time now, is trying to train our teachers better. Yes? Uh, on that note, when I, I'm a uh, graduate student here, and I teach an introductory bio class. And we're basically teachers just thrown into it without any training. Or we, we have our content, and then we choose how to teach that. And we do all this work to get these kids into sciences and some sciences in the um, high school and middle school, but then when they hit college, it's sink or swim or a weed out class. So I have this perception that now that I'm a TA, that I'm just trying not to screw it up. Like they've gotten this far, and you know I'm just trying to keep them inspired, keep them exposed, not weed them out. Right. I wonder if you think that's a problem that TAs don't have teaching experience, and that we're just kind of thrown into it. Am I allowed to field this question? <laughs> 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 well, so, f first of all, this is a known problem, and it's not just true of TAs, it is true of professors. You are not hired at a research one institution for your teaching skills. You are hired because you are good at research. Um, and so, that is a problem. But it has become, it is now at the point where there is a recognition of that. We, in fact, are now part of a network of 25 universities, which is our Centers for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning, where the whole point is to try and deal with that issue not only so that we have good teachers in our own classrooms, but so that as you go on and become a professor, that you will be a good mentor and a good professor. But it takes time, and there are certainly not even necessarily old guard professors who do not value 
the teaching and part of the challenge is then for us to make it have people understand the value that they get from their teaching. I have a question for you. Do you think you understand biology better for teaching at a level that you ought to know already? I don't. I, don't, I feel like I, I'm teaching the subject. I'm an ecologist, and I'm teaching cell biology. I think that's irresponsible as far as who's teaching it. <laughs> you don't think that you should have that sort of broad understanding? Yes, yes, I do have, have that broad understanding. But as far as you're paying for the expertise, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that's a disservice that maybe a cell biologist should be teaching cell biology in that little section. And as an ecologist, I would be better at teaching ecology. And sometimes that comes down to the state funding level. Sometimes that's something that we really face on, on the state level um, with the legislator is talking about we need, we need the funding. We need current funding. We need increased funding to the University of Missouri systems to encourage situations where we can, we can train individuals better that are in your situation to be able to more handle uh, the type of situation that you're in as well as hire more professors and more specialists and more people that are more that are better at educating than necessarily just these research-based um, professors and institutions and people that uh, people that are more inept to uh, to be able to to be able to teach not only TAs and but students as well and that's something that we really fight with on the state level um, to increase funding. I mean, just due to the fact that all these things are expensive, as you as you mentioned earlier, these things are very expensive, and so. Uh, and so we're trying to do what we can, and the, that's something that each and every person in the room can do, is talk to their state legislator and, uh, and talk to them about how the University of Missouri system needs increased funding and, and at least level funding, if nothing else. And but so, it's not just Missouri. I mean, there's a misconnect between the rewards and what you do in a, a, as a professor. You were told you're supposed to do research, teaching, and service, but the only thing that gets rewarded is your publications and your research. And so if you don't publish, you don't get tenure. If you don't publish, you don't get promoted. And so teaching and service goes by the wayside. So we can, and that's across the country. That's not just Missouri. It's how many publications do you have? They don't even ask you, does anybody read them? It doesn't matter. As long as, <laughs> as long as, as you have it. Because every time we write a paper, we're writing a paper to teach somebody something. So we, you can't, there is a, there is a vetting process uh, through the scholarly process, there's a vetting process that, that makes us, improves our teaching skills every time we write a I'm paper, not, not and there's complementary activities. Right. I'm not arguing against this is fun. very robust publication right here, but that's the only thing that really gets reported. No, sure. Doug, did you have a comment? Uh, <clears throat> one of the a problem that's been recognized is in the next 10 years, we're going to need a million STEM people, STEM educated people that can work in anything from being a PhD <coughs> researcher to the education or the, uh, and I think we can finally stem even a high school chemistry teacher as a STEM person is, is proper. If you look at the data of the, of the kids that come into a university or into a college, in the STEM related fields or STEM based fields, the end of the freshman, sophomore, in that area, 50% of them are gone. They've transferred out for a number of reasons. Most frequently, as the professors are boring. They don't care about me. Uh, it's true. They don't because, again, it's the research that I've got to get back to the lab. I've got to do this. We do have some <laughs> wonderful teachers that are first-class researchers. So if we can move the retention rate from 50% high 50s in the STEM fields of students that come in. You've solved your million people over the next 10 years. So we've got to go back to getting faculty to be first educators uh, right alongside their, their need to be uh, researchers. <coughs> and I think, and the administration I think has some ways uh, uh, coming at us down the road that are gonna help solve this problem. Interesting, the same data that you put up if we look at 2010 enacted budget and the 2012 enacted budget, it's a 20% decrease over all education programs in the federal government. That's, that's pretty sad. Uh, so we have to learn how to be more efficient. With regard to these, under, these other after school programs, uh, you mentioned Dean Kamen. Dean's first year competition in the robotics, this is a program he started. Dean didn't even finished college in 
Segway is his invention. Uh, things like this, but it's it's the what he has done. His first meeting of this robotic competition was a handful high school gym in New, New Hampshire. Last year, uh, like, well, maybe it was the year before, he had to cut 50% of the people attending at the Georgia Dome. 70,000 people, kids attending, and their teachers and associated people attending this event. It was a Super Bowl event. And this is an after school activity. So this can have huge impact on these kids. And we need to all sort out. You see, they had 113,000 engineers in California alone willing to help. So we, all, we as professional STEM people need to get out there and help in our communities. Yes, but we have to find a way to sell it in terms of those of us that are in a position to facilitate participating in not just the, the first, but any sort of science activities. There has to be some way in which that is rewarded. And at present, that is not true. Um, that you, you have to get some benefit out of it as a professor, that, because otherwise you are not gonna sell it to most of the professoriate. And so how do you go about, I mean, I have my own ideas, but how do you go about being able to get all these people who are very good at this to actually buy into teaching and outreach are going to help them because that's the only way you're going to get widespread buy-in. It's ridiculous that I, I have to go to Manhattan, Kansas to, to participate in an engineering competition. I'm in Columbia, Missouri. There's an engineering department right here. It's ridiculous that I have to pay for my 12 kids at Lang, Lang Middle School to travel all the way out to, to Manhattan, Kansas to participate in an engineering competition. It was full. They had people from Oklahoma. They had people from all over the place. That's where they met. Now, I couldn't, I can't do that here. I mean, that's ridiculous. That, and so, you know, we're talking about the, the, de, the, the robotics competition, it's about relevance. You want to, it's, it's re, kids wonder every day they walk into, into classes and they're wondering, what the heck am I going to use this for? What am I going to use this for? And the thing that's great about the, the robotics competition, go to, go, to the, go to the career center and look at the robotic, the, the robot that they've built. It's relevance. It's, they're doing high level math. They're doing high level science. They're doing incredible programming. And it's all in that, that, that setting, and we have university um, students that are helping. We have university professors that are that are doing because it's the right thing to do. I mean, it's the right thing to do, and sometimes you do it just because it's the right thing to do. And you know, if if we're we're all a community, you know, especially in Columbia, if we're all living in this community, it's our community. These are our kids. We need to have opportunities for our kids, and. Sometimes you just do it because it's the right thing. And that's what, that's what we do in education. That's what we do in public education every day. You do it because it's the right thing to do. I think we're blessed in Columbia. I mean, we've got a community that's education oriented. But there's a whole lot of this state that is not in that mindset. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to see the, the, the students willing to go down and talk to the legislature. We all have to have that. 30 second or that 15 second comment on, on what education is, what our research is about, or, or what science is about. The public is in awe of so many things <coughs> that are STEM related. If you can, every time you run into somebody, your neighbor, you can get this message up, it helps. But what kicked the, uh, the students in gear? Huge tuition increases. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we've all got to get out there before it's too late. Mm -hmm. We were blessed in my generation. I'm older than 90% of you. <laughs> uh, women didn't have the opportunities back in the 50s that they have today. So what could they do? They could be teachers. I was blessed in rural South Dakota with some of the most, the best teachers I've ever run into. Because they couldn't go be an engineer. They couldn't go be these things back in the 50s. They were teachers, nurses, or secretaries. Secretaries, yeah. And so we had this incredible talent base down there. Right now, it's our minority base that is incredibly talented. We just have to be able to get them in the proper environment to blossom. The women who used to be 
the teachers. I'm not saying that teachers today aren't equally as good, but that was their only opportunity, so the process of sorting, you know, gave us the very best. We need to do that at all levels. Uh, I have a daughter, in mar she's in marketing, and I have a son who's in a PhD immunologist chair professor. She makes five times more money than he does. And she says, I have to sell people things. He's trying to cure them. It doesn't make, doesn't any, make sense. any sense. <laughs> to build off of that, um, my, my mother was a, a, a teacher at Scholars Academy over the summer when it first uh, began back in the 80s, I think. I don't think she's liking telling that. But uh, she, uh, um, she taught a lot of the kids, obviously it's kids from all across Missouri, so like you're saying, a lot of kids from rural Missouri came in and they were really afraid because they could, their education could not match up to the kids in the urban center. So they, their AP classes did not compare to a fifth grade education that you get at some of our higher universities in Columbia and St. Louis and Kansas City. So my, my question would be, yeah, we have a great STEM education opportunities here in Columbia and urban centers, but how do we get STEM education out to the rural areas where you can't attract these types of, of teachers and they certainly don't get the pay that would attract them out there, but how do you save those kids? Like uh, Dr. Speck was saying, the socioeconomic kids who can't pay for this or don't have access to it. Is there something you guys are doing research on or something that you know has been able to address or a way that you can reach these rural kids? Yeah, well, okay. one thing NASA is doing is a digital media learning program. <laughs> so we're trying to do more things via uh, uh, satellite TV coverage to a rural area, Skype, uh, you know, where you can take experts to those areas that are underrepresented or underserved um, and don't have perhaps the funding to build up their own programs. But I mean, that's, I, I think, again, this is one of those things where it takes a lot of of activities to kind of bring together to focus on that. So that's and, one thing we're doing. Yeah, in, uh, in Missouri, the online education is definitely growing at all levels. And so I know the College of Education is working on a project to have courses for students to take in any school in Missouri. And so that's being worked on. There's a I think they're offering two courses right now, aren't they, Troy? And they have a couple more in development. So online learning is kind of the easiest way, in a way, in a sense, of doing that. Um, there's also a large statewide initiative we're working on right now trying to get funding from the National Science Foundation to increase the infrastructure, specifically cyber infrastructure and bioinformatics type of infrastructure across the state. So if we're successful in that, that would bring about $4 million direct to Missouri every year to increase in those areas. So that's one that's happening right now that if we get that, that will help the state in countless ways that we can't even anticipate right now. Other states have really leveraged that for other opportunities. So. I see that as being immediate ways of doing it. But cyber, cyber is kind of, it's the trend, and that's what can work. Does everybody have 4-H or Missouri Relief Fund? No, 4-H is, the 4-H Foundation is national, um, and Missouri has a very strong 4-H program. Okay. They have a science and technology focus. Uh, it's called the well, SET even curriculum. Even leadership skills, like um, interacting with folks who maybe have the book smarts, but not the street smarts, mm -hmm. having grown up in a farming community Yeah, we have a lot of faculty who participate in the 4-H summer camps, running week-long institutes for students in things like GPS and plant sciences, exactly. and veterinary science. Yeah. 4-H so. has a uh, not dynamite camp, but explosion. How do you, how do, you do a controlled explosion? You have to be a junior. <laughs> Blowing stuff up is always popular. Yeah, that's always popular. Yeah. Um, there's a school in there's a school in Indianapolis. My son just visited. Uh, it's called New Tech High School. At 95% free and reduced lunch, they have a 75% college acceptance rate. And what they do there, it's not anything. It's it's not any amazing or any it's not like they have all this technology brought into the school it's all project-based learning it's all about project it's all about relevance it's about what's relevant and and everything is posed to him as a problem Annie Sobel um, Dr. Sobel here at the University she's a talking about a somebody who's an overachiever she's a doctor she's an engineer and she's a general in the military so I mean that talk about a woman who's an overachiever that's but she is working on a project right now with e with the uh, um, e folks on a, um, 
a biotechnology competition for students as an you know an outreach for students and it's all about it's project based so if it's it's there's a a blockage or a thrombosis in, in, in the blood bloodstream and, and the kids have to design, have to create a, a device that catches that blockage. And so it's an action, and, th and then they have to find a way to non-invasively get that device into the body. And so it's a, it's a real project. And she's gonna roll this out to these students. Well, you can't just roll this out as a competition out, out there with kids without there being some kind of carrot involved. So she's gonna throw iPads out there. You know, they might, the kid, the, the winning competition might get an iPad. That, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, out in the rural communities, this is open to anybody. This is open to, to whatever. And so those are the types of things that I'd like to see us promote. And, you know, the, if we're gonna be promoting cyber education, let's make it, let's make it project based. Let's make it real, you know, relevant for our kids. I personally, I think it's a wonderful idea. I think that they're on the right track. Um, the, the, the academy that my son would be involved in would be the STEM academy. He'd be in that STEM, that STEM field. And uh, it's going to be a major, if they do continue on that path, it's gonna be a major shift. But I think that uh, the, the academy is, is a, it's, it's a career path. You know, it's career paths for kids. It's, you know, taking that, that those kids that wanna go and be involved in, let's say, STEM. You know, once that want to go down that path, it's it's to to build that academy and get those teachers together so that they can collaborate. You know, have a, a science, a math, and an or a technology teacher there so they can collaborate together. Um, I think it has it has a lot of. It's very interesting to see it to see what's going to happen. Can I just comment on that because um, most of you can probably tell from the accent I didn't grow up here. And, um, You're from Boonville, right? The, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds a lot like the British system. <laughs> ruthless, which is horrible for anybody who doesn't know what they want to do at the age of 13. Mm -hmm. How many kids really know what they want to do when they're 13? They have an idea. Mm -hmm. I was lucky. I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was five. But <laughs> most people, we have students who come here, and one of the wonderful things about the American system is that it's very forgiving. It allows you to come to college without having made that decision. Even if you finish with a bachelor's degree, you can then change your mind and go in a different direction for graduate school. The British system, which follows this very narrowing, constricting thing, means you get there faster. You can have a PhD at 24, mm -hmm. but it's very unforgiving, and if you change your mind, you are screwed. So I have some concerns. I, I like the idea that for people who know what they want to do, this is a wonderful thing. The majority of people don't. And there's I'll a lot of there's a lot of honor.